From the 29th of July 2018, Bromsgrove became the second southern terminus of Birmingham's Cross City Line. The current station opened two years earlier, replacing the older station located slightly to the north. The Cross City Line is approximately 33 miles in length and passes through Birmingham New Street and up to Litchfield Trent Valley. The Class 323 electric multiple units have been recorded for posterity and are due to be replaced by Class 730 Aventra trains at some point in the future. The 323s were introduced at the start of 1994 when the Cross City Line's original route from Redditch to Litchfield was electrified. Leaving Bromsgrove, we pass the site of the original station, which opened on the Birmingham and Gloucester Railway way back in 1840. Immediately apparent beyond the next overbridge is the start of the Licky Incline. At 1 in 37 and for 2 miles, this is the steepest mainline gradient in the country. In earlier times, many trains required the assistance of banking locomotives with associated logistical consideration to ensure that the train reached the top. Even today, many of the freight trains which traverse the bank must have a banking locomotive at the back to assist with the climb. Our class 323 is struggling as well, as the line speed at this point should be 90 miles an hour. The summit of the climb ends here at Blackwell, the site of a station that closed in 1966. now passes under the M42. We're now approaching Barnt Green, where the Cross City Line's other branch from Redditch converges on the right. Until the line to Bromsgrove was electrified in 2018, Barnt Green was the only place in Britain where a single electrified branch line met a double track non electrified main line.
Midland Railway, the company who took over the workings of the Birmingham and Gloucester Railway, quadrupled this five mile section to as far as Kings Norton between 1892 and 1930. Today there are only three tracks. The one on the left is unelectrified and referred to as the Up Slow. The train enters Cofton Cutting. It is 70 feet deep in some places and supported by concrete retaining walls. In fact, this used to be a tunnel and had the narrowest bore of any on the former Midland Railway. The normal space between the running lines, which is 6 feet, had to be compacted down to 5 feet 1 inch. The tunnel was opened out between 1928 and 1930 when the route was quadrupled but the rock here was so hard that it became a mammoth task before the two extra tracks could be laid sufficiently. When the line was being electrified, the hardness of the rock proven to be even more of a challenge as drilling holes into the ground to support the electrification masts took around two to three hours, whereas in some places further up the line where the rock wasn't this thick, it would take only 20 minutes. The siding to the left is used to turn back some trains that terminate at Longbridge. Pretty useful at peak times when trains are busy. Coming in from the left is the remains of the Hales Owen Railway from Old Hill, which was opened in 1878 and closed in 1964. Parts of the line however remained opened until 1995, allowing freight trains to serve the Longbridge motor plant. There have been two previous stations serving the Longbridge area. The first was in use from 1840 to 1849. Another station was located on the Hales Owen Railway and lived and breathed between 1915 and 1964. The present day station opened at the start of the Cross City Line services back in 1978 and remained the first southern terminus of the route until the service extended to Redditch two years later. Slow lines have been electrified along here. The centre non electrified tracks are used by cross country and West Midlands railway trains to destinations in the south, such as Bristol and Worcester. opened in 1870 when the route was a part of the Midland Railway. 
The island platform was opened in 1892 when the company quadrupled the line, but the two outer faces were installed in 1978. Located on the former island platform are sculptures carved from old railway sleepers by Rosemary Terry, an artist based in Wolverhampton. By the late 1980s, a plan was formed to do away with the DMU fleet, which had become increasingly unreliable, and the West Midland Passenger Transport Executive pressed for electrification. This was where electrification first started for the Cross City Line back in May 1990, the overhead wire being energised at 25 kV AC. Just under three years later, the electrification was completed on the 6th of June 1993. Round about this time too, stations at Redditch, Wolf Church and Blake Street were all rebuilt and several other stations, including Barn Green, were extensively modified to accommodate the new, longer electric trains. present-day King's Norton station dates from 1849, and the former station buildings positioned at the end of the down platform were demolished in 2006. The two Birmingham routes divide here. The original course of the 1840-built Birmingham and Gloucester continues straight ahead, and is now used entirely by freight since the withdrawal of passenger services in 1941. The route is referred to now as the Camp Hill Line, and the B&G terminated at a station called Camp Hill, though subsequently the line extended to join the London and Birmingham Railway to the latter's Curzon Street terminus. Camp Hill line branches away to the right. It is hoped to resume local services on the route by the end of 2024, after a break of nearly 84 years. The expansion of these services via new cords connecting the line to Moore Street are currently in the early planning stages. Two tracks coming in from the right are known as the Lifford Curve, connecting with the Camp Hill line and is subjected to a speed limit of 10 miles an hour. It's now little used, but once it allowed goods traffic coming from the central goods depot to bypass the New Street area. Coming alongside us to the right is the Worcester and Birmingham Canal that parallels the railway to as far as five ways. The line we are now on was built by the Birmingham West Suburban Railway, which opened in 1876. Pretty cheap and easy to build, the line fell into the Midland Railway's hands, who set about doubling the track, easing the various curves 
and constructing the tunnels into the New Street station area. The station here at Bourneville is adjacent to the Cadbury's factory, which was relocated from the centre of Birmingham in 1879. The new premises, in what was then located in open countryside, provided better transport access to both the railway and canal. There were never any good facilities here at the station, but north of here the factory had its very own railway system, totalling up to some six miles. It started operating in 1884, resulting in the purchase of six steam locomotives, initially steam powered and finally replaced by diesel, which marshalled three outbound trains every day except Sundays. The railway works were closed on the 28th of May 1976. The approaching overbridge was where the railway works crossed our line to the waterside wharf and sidings. The line now passes over the Worcester and Birmingham Canal for the first time on the approach to Selly Oak. The tall clock tower in the background is a part of Birmingham's largest hospital, the Queen Elizabeth. Next to the hospital is the university and the station of the same name, which is also served by Cross Country and West Midlands Railway services to both Cardiff and Worcester respectively. The official launch of the Cross City Line services was celebrated here at University Station on the 8th of May 1978 by William Rogers, the former Secretary of State for Transport. It's one of the busiest stations on the line, particularly in off-peak times, as passengers who alight here for both the university and hospital do not work conventional office hours. Recently, University Station has been modernised with brand new station buildings on both platforms, built in anticipation for the heavy usage in passenger traffic. In addition to this, a brand new footbridge was constructed over the canal, linking the station with the vast University complex.
railway now comes right alongside the canal for this short section, meaning that when the line was being electrified, strengthened cantilevers had to be installed to the left, as if they were installed on the right, the pylons would have been placed in the middle of the towpath. The train now passes the site of two closed stations on the approach to the city centre. The first was here at Somerset Road, and closed in 1930. Just after the tunnel was Church Road, the first out of the two to close in 1925. A line used to diverge to the right towards the central goods depot. But also before that, in 1876, the West Suburban route diverged here as well to its small little terminus at Granville Street. Trains used to terminate there until 1885, until the Midland constructed the tunnels into an enlarged New Street station. This also meant passing under the numerous streets and the canal. With the opening of the line into New Street, trains off the Midland that came from Derby via Camp Hill could now be diverted through this route. The station here at Five Ways effectively replaced Granville Street from 1885 until it closed in 1944. In 1978 the station reopened and serves the suburbs of Five Ways and Lee Bank, still retaining its blue bricks on the retaining wall. The line descends at 1 in 77 as we pass through the tunnels into New Street. shows the driver we will arrive at platform 8.
there are a bewildering array of tracks leading towards the station, with its 12 through platforms and west-facing bay. platforms have been split halfway to allow for more trains to be accommodated on them. We arrive on platform 8 and being formed of six carriages our train will fit nicely within its whole length. New Street is one of the largest and busiest stations in the country. It is a major destination for Avanti West Coast services from London Euston to Preston and Glasgow etc. The Cross Country Network. The local and suburban services within the West Midlands and Transport for Wales trains up to Aberystwyth and Hollyhead. The station was redeveloped between 2010 and 2015, costing £550 million, which includes a new concourse, a new exterior facade and a new shopping centre called the Grand Central. New Street Station handles 30.7 million passenger entries and exits per annum and is indeed one of the busiest interchanges outside London, with 4 million passengers changing trains at the station each year. In 2018, New Street had a passenger satisfaction rate of 92%, the third highest in the UK. Eastern exit to New Street is by two tunnels. The one we enter is called the Derby Tunnel, whilst the one to the left is called the Stour Tunnel. Unbeknownst to many of the travelling public is that the tunnels pass beneath the platforms of Birmingham Moor Street Station on the former Great Western Railway. From the driver's eye view, you can see the switchback effect of the rising and falling gradients.
Proof House Junction, the various routes go their separate ways as we rise onto Lawley Street Viaduct. This was constructed in 1893 to take trains over the congested tracks leading into the Curzon Street goods depot. Curzon Street had been the one-time terminus of the London and Birmingham Railway from London Euston, dating from 1838. We're now travelling over the Grand Junction Railway, which opened on the 4th of July 1837, Birmingham's very first railway. It ended at Vauxhall, now called Duddeston, but extended to Curzon Street a year later to terminate alongside the London and Birmingham Railway. The Grand Junction was actually built as a link between the Liverpool and Manchester and London and Birmingham Railways to form the first intercity trunk railway in the world. Duddeston opened as Vauxhall in 1837. Adjacent to the station are the remains of the Grand Junction engine sheds, which opened in 1840. In 1891, this mile-long section to Aston was quadrupled, but today only two tracks remain, the ones next to us left to rust and to be consumed by nature. From the right, on the approach to Aston, is the electrified freight link from Stetchford on the London and Birmingham, another useful route bypassing New Street. The route of the Grand Junction, which has a wide sweeping arc from Perry Bar through Aston to Vauxhall, was dictated by the refusal of James Watt the Younger, the tenant of Aston Hall, to allow the railway to encroach upon Aston Park in the grounds of the hall, as planned in the Act from Parliament in 1833. In preparation for electrification, the two mechanical signal boxes, Aston No. 1 and No. 2, were closed. Semaphore signalling was replaced by multiple aspect colour light signals, and control transferred to the power box at New Street. Today, signalling is with the box at Saltley, at the West Midland Signalling Centre. The Grand Junction continues ahead, taking trains on the Chase Line towards Walsall and Rugeley, and for freight trains to gain access to Bescott Yard. We now branch off that line and onto what was once the Sutton Coalfield branch, opening in 1862 by the London and North Western Railway. Ahead of us is Junction 6 of the M6 and A38M, the busiest road interchange in Europe and given the appellation Spaghetti Junction, as many of the roads twist and turn on top of each other.
gravelly hill is set within a deep cutting, meaning that the station building on the up platform had to be built with two storeys. The other buildings and an earlier wooden footbridge were removed at the time of electrification. The route is now dead straight in some sections for the next three miles to Sutton Coalfield, excluding the sharp curve around Chester Road. Chester Road was opened a year after the line. The station booking office and waiting room were rebuilt between 1991 and 1992.
ever since the beginning of our journey, signalling has been under the control of the West Midland Signalling Centre, but after Aston North Junction, this has changed and we are now under the jurisdiction of Aston Signal Box, the box being located south of Duddeson Station, which we saw earlier. The box controls the line from Aston North Junction right up until the end of the platform at Litchfield Trent Valley, and if you look carefully on the signals from here, the identification plate has the letters AN, which confirms we are indeed under the control of this box. Now arriving at Sutton Coalfield on a curve. Sutton Coalfield was the terminus of the five mile branch from Aston in 1862, and remained the northern terminus of the branch for 22 years until in 1884 the route extended northwards to Litchfield City. The station is of Victorian architecture with red bricks and elaborate ceilings and pillars, a typical design flair of the LNWR. Sadly, on the 23rd of January 1955, Sutton experienced a horrible train crash when a diverted York to Bristol Express failed to navigate the curve, killing 17. Following the accident, line speed restriction signs were universally adopted. Previously, there had been no visible reminder to the driver of speed restrictions on many routes. Leaving Sutton Coalfield, we pass through a short tunnel underneath the town centre. Beyond the tunnel is where the Freight Only Sutton Park Line crosses.
more trains an hour end here at Four Oaks, as two of the half-hourly services from Redditch terminate at the station in the Bay platform. When the railway arrived here in 1884, there was nothing but green fields. However, the land was ripe for long-term development and has today become a part of the sprawl of Birmingham. tower above the trees is the Sutton Coalfield Transmitting Station. Installed in 1949, it provided the first television service outside London. Butler's Lane was opened as a temporary wooden station in 1957 to coincide with the introduction of the new DMU units on the Birmingham to Litchfield route. Originally the station was known as Butler's Lane Halt, despite being staffed from the beginning. Although as just said, the wooden platforms were meant to be temporary, they lasted here until 1992 before the route was electrified for the cross city line EMUs. marks the end of the transport for West Midlands area. Notice the crossover on the approach to the station. Little used these days, but can be used to turn back certain trains if running late, or if engineering works are occurring ahead. now leaves the built-up area behind and we head out into the countryside and northwards towards Litchfield.
village of Shenstone has the joys of two trains an hour stopping here at the station. The Grand Station building on the up platform with two storeys is now Grade 2 listed. now crosses the M6 toll motorway, followed by the A5 London to Hollyhead Trunk Road, a descendant of the former Roman road known as Watling Street. approaching the city of Litchfield, we can see Litchfield Cathedral, the only one in the country to have three spires. disused line coming in from the left is the former freight line that used to serve the Anglesey Sidings freight terminal. Historically, this was the route to Walsall, which opened beyond Litchfield to Witchner Junction on the Derby Main Line back in 1849 by the South Staffordshire Railway. It closed south of Brown Hills in 1968. The station at Litchfield City still retains a lot of character dating back to LNWR days. 
The original station, built in 1849, was demolished in 1882, in readiness to accommodate the extra services coming from Sutton Coalfield. It's just one and a quarter miles now to Litchfield Trent Valley. Out of the 33 miles from Bromsgrove, the cross city line has been formed by at least six former railway companies, or seven if travelling from Redditch. Little mention was made of the Redditch branch earlier on. It had originally been built back in 1859 by the Redditch Railway, nominally independent from the Midland and was provided as a useful bypass route for trains avoiding the Licky Hills. There is just the one platform at Litchfield Trent Valley to reverse the electric class 323s back to Bromsgrove. The tracks continue unelectrified ahead towards Wichner Junction and Burton on Trent on the Derby Main Line. Just visible ahead too is the signal box, a box which has a lot of LNWR character as well. The low-level platforms these days are used by hourly London North Western Railway services between Crewe and London. And so the Class 323s will be history on the Cross City Line, due to be transferred to Northern and be replaced by brand new class 730 Aventras.